Well, our guest today, Robert Halfon, the Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party and the MP for Harlow, and Ollie Martins, Labour's Police and Crime Commissioner for Bedfordshire, and in Essex, James Abbott from the Green Party. Mr Abbott, um, this is good news, isn't it, for our energy security? No, absolutely not. Um, we think this is the wrong investment, and the wrong investment in the wrong place as well, particularly with regard to Bradwell, which is an internationally important wildlife site, a Ramsar site. But wherever you put it, you are the, the, peop the environmentalists are going to say this is not the right site. Well, the Green Party takes a completely different view on the energy policy, full stop. We don't think we should be investing in nuclear at all. We think we should be investing in renewables. And in fact, there's a report out this week by the committee that advises the government on its energy policy that renewables are going to be competitive with all forms of energy within the next 10 years. But we are closing some new nuclear power stations within the next 30 years and there will be an energy gap. Are you saying that you believe that renewables can fill the whole of that gap? Uh, renewables have a major part to play in filling that gap. Uh, if the latest figures for the last quarter show renewables have now moved into second place in terms of sector electricity production. 25% of UK electricity was reduced by renewables in the last quarter. And of course the key thing about nuclear is there's a very long lead-in time for these sites. The latest estimates on Hinkley is that it might not be producing electricity until the mid-2020s. Bradwell could be after that. And what about all of the jobs which this will create, much needed in that part of the region? We absolutely need to invest in energy infrastructure and we need to invest in that partly because of obviously energy need and because of the jobs. But just look at what the government's doing with the current cuts to renewables. There's already a thousand jobs gone out of the solar sector and tens of thousands could follow on the current trajectory. So the government is making the wrong choices about energy investment. I'm going to bring in Robert Halfon now. Uh, just stay there if you wouldn't mind. Um, is that a good point that you're not helping the renewables sector and yet you're investing all this money in Well, nuclear? we are, and the government have significantly increased renewable energy over the past few years. But there's a very important... Well, he says you're cutting it. It's not, not the case. If you look at the renewable energy sector, it's gone up hugely over the past few years. But there are three important principles underlying all this. The first is energy security for our country, and this will guarantee energy security for our country. The second is creating thousands of jobs. If you look at the Hinkley example, 25,000 jobs will be created. That's 18, billion pound, uh, sorry, 18 million pounds worth of investment, but also it's about pushing prices down for the consumer. In France, energy prices are cheaper because they have nuclear power we, stations. We've gone off onto a slightly different subject. Just, again, challenge him on this thing about cutting the, the subsidies for renewables. He says they're not doing it. Oh, they are. I mean, the, the, the government have announced a consultation where they're going to cut the feed-in tariff for solar by almost 90% and commentators from the United Nations to the head of the CBI have said it's the wrong thing to do. Mr Halfon. Yeah. Well, what I've said is that the government, of the amount of renewable energy under the government, the coalition government, cutting the this subsidy by 90 percent under the last under the last few years, the amount of renewable energy that has, has gone up enormously, uh, being used by the government. But what we need is sustainable energy. So we need energy we to guarantee. More? We need energy that will guarantee our, our economic security, that will guarantee jobs and will push prices down. And as has been shown in France, as I just said, the uh, nuclear power stations have helped keep energy bills down for consumers and that is incredibly important. The good thing, Mr Abbott, is that this is not a fossil fuel. No, it's not, but it's not zero carbon. There are carbon costs associated with nuclear, particularly to do with the refining of uranium, but I'm interested in the idea that um, the nuclear policy is going to keep energy bills down. Uh, the government are actually embarking on a policy where they're going to subsidise nuclear power. That's explicit now in the Hinkley deal. Uh, Mr. Martin, there have been, been concerns, haven't there, about security for nuclear power, especially with the Chinese coming in, with your police hat on. What do you think about that? Well, I am concerned really that. Um, Doing a deal like this with the Chinese, you know, the, the Chinese, it's not like doing a deal with the Americans or the Europeans, you know. A few months ago we saw the Chinese were manipulating, the government were manipulating their stock market, we know they manipulate their currency. It's not like doing a deal with one of the, uh, the usual family of Western nations. 
So, I mean, I think, as we saw in your report, the idea of developing links with China and drawing them into that family of nations is good. But I think giving them um, ownership over part of our strategic infrastructure, our power supply, actually that is something that gives me cause for concern. Bernard Jenkins wants an inquiry, doesn't he? He wants, he wants this looked at thoroughly before we go into this. Would you agree with that? Oh, of course, Ber um, Bernard is, is right to raise these issues. He's a nearby, not the constituency MP, but the nearby MP. But I go back to the original point. This is billions of pounds worth of investment across the country, not just in the east of England. It will create many thousands of jobs. The examples overseas have shown it pushes down energy prices, and I want ordinary uh, uh, taxpayers and the people who are paying uh, high energy bills to have their energy uh, bills reduced. And, and that is why I think we should back these proposals and welcome the investment. Britain, yeah. the UK nuclear authority, will have complete safeguarding, will be completely in charge of what ultimately happens, and nothing will get approved unless uh, it goes through the normal planning procedures. Yes, a few years ago, yeah. we might have thought that doing a deal with the Russians like this would have been a good idea because we were getting friendly with the Russians. But now, I think our assessment would be completely different. And I think we are dealing with a potentially volatile part of the world. They do not operate like a Western democratic nation. And therefore, I think that giving them such a significant investment in strategic infrastructure is a high well, risk proposition. I think as your student showed, uh, one of the students showed in, in the clip just now, China is a major nation of the world. Um, we can either choose to close our doors and then it will turn in on well, itself, or we collaborate and cooperate with a them difference where between possible. Engagement and giving them uh, strategic control of our strategic infrastructure. Uh, let well, me I just ask Mr Abbott again. Are, are you worried about this Chinese involvement or in, in this, or is yours purely and simply a nuclear argument? No, absolutely. We're concerned about the security aspects of this, and the local MP Bernard Jenkin has said that several times, including in Parliament this week. On the security, though, of energy, I mean, what a daft policy this government's got. The UK has the best renewable capacity in Europe in terms of wind, solar, hydroelectric and all the other forms of potential renewable energy. That's where we should be investing. Mr Abbott, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, and what thank we will you. do is come back and talk some more after this. Now to our emergency services and the possibility of even closer links between the police and fire officers. Partnerships between the blue light services already exist but the Police and Crime Commissioner in Northamptonshire believes that a full merger is the best way forward. Sam Reid reports. The front line of police and fire working together in the Northamptonshire countryside. This 4x4 is manned by one police officer and one firefighter, here checking the site of a previous suspicious haystack fire. Now the government, though, is considering going further merging the two services into one organisation in some areas. Northamptonshire's Police and Crime Commissioner is at the forefront of the idea. For me, I stood up in February 2013 and I said that I think it's bananas that in the 21st century we have such diverse organisations that do the same job. And why can't they all be one organisation? Why three control rooms? Why three kind of sets of numbers that people have to phone and, and get through to? So this is, I think, just a natural modern step. So this is about a forward-looking emergency service. The number of fires has fallen in recent years, as has recorded crime. But budgets are being cut too, creating challenges. This week, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary told both Bedfordshire and Northamptonshire Police they require improvement. Policing is now heading into uncharted waters. And we're very clear that there will be some forces in the future that will find it much more difficult to provide the level of service to the public than that they've been able to provide in the past. The Fire Brigade Union is worried about changes to jobs. In a statement, it said the police service is perceived very differently to the fire service. Our members enjoyed the neutrality that the fire service has. Firefighters are well liked, and in some areas, the police are not. The role of the police is law enforcement. The Fire and Rescue Service has a completely different role. In Suffolk, these joint police and fire cadets are just one of the ways the services are working together. By the time these young people are in work, joint police and fire stations that are already in place in the county and a planned single community safety unit could be the norm. But how have existing staff found the changes? When we spoke to them about their police colleagues coming to work alongside them, there was a degree of nervousness around it. 
Um, but I'm delighted to say that actually once um, once they start working together, all of those sort of concerns and fears that they may have had have melted away. The ambulance service is being urged to find new ways to work with police and fire. But for now, it's been left out of firm merger plans. But when it comes to the police and fire service, the road ahead appears to lead to much closer working. Ollie Martins, your uh, police and crime commissioner colleagues thought it was bananas that you don't do these things. So, are you in favour of merging? Well, I think there's an inevitability about having a far closer relationship between emergency services and potentially merging. Um, because, for example, They're I different face skills, aren't they? They're, yes, I mean, but I think there's still ways in which they can be closer aligned. Though um, sharing estates is one example. We just saw sharing vehicle fleet procurement, vehicle management, um, a lot of back office functions, the control room. There are certainly economies and efficiencies to be made. Um, and when you consider that uh, in Bedfordshire I'm potentially facing the prospect of having to find £30 million of savings from a £100 million budget, then you know no option is off the table. It's very difficult, isn't it? The, the government has cut the amount of money the police forces have, and yet we still expect them to operate safely. That, the two don't add up. 20% cuts since 20, 2011. Well, well, no one would deny there have not been difficult decisions taken by the government because we face a large deficit, we still face a significant debt despite the fact that the deficit has gone down by half as a proportion of GDP. But I think this is an important idea that we should be looking at. The government has set up a special £70 million fund to look at integration of services. If you look at places like Hampshire, they've saved uh, something like £4 million by uh, trying to merge or link together emergency services. The same has happened in Merseyside. They've saved th £3 million linking up uh, but these things. So I think we have to look at it. And if we can save money for the public by linking up the emergency services, um, then that is a good thing, even in the difficult economic climate that we live in. But you see, he's got, he's got uh, Luton takes a lot of your money, doesn't it? And, so, uh, and a lot of your effort. Um, so it's a, it's an area of high demand and it's a complex area to police. And yeah. if you were trying to join up with other forces, would they want to come in and take over that high demand area? It's pro taking over Bedfordshire Police is probably not an attractive proposition for the neighbouring forces. Uh, and really, this is this is the core of the issue around um, emergency service collaboration. The government is not mandating it. Uh, they're not saying this is the structure that we're going to have. So they're, they're, they're trying to do it by consensus. So uh, you and actually, you when, you it, when you're looking at police forces working together or potentially merging, um, who wants to work with Bedfordshire Police when our finances are in the state that they're in? Uh, and you know, the different emergency services, their budget pressures are in different states. So the speed at which they want to work together just, is just, all... Just spell that out for me. You're saying the government should come in and say, right, Bedfordshire, you should work with a neighbouring well, county, and, and it's not up to you, it's up to us. You referenced HMIC's report. Yeah. Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary are putting a big question mark over the future sustainability of Bedfordshire Police because of what is happening to our finances. You haven't um, answered my question. Well, are you saying the government should come in and tell you to do it and it should be out of your the hands? The big imponderable is... What happens when a police force is unsustainable? Does it have to merge with a neighbouring force? But at the moment, the government are saying, we're only having mergers where everyone is agreed on it. And which of well, our neighbours I mean, would, 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 would want to Would you be in favour of the government coming in and saying, right, like, you do it? Absolutely not. I think we, what we have to do is see what works. And I think, the, as I say, the government set up this special fund, £70 million, to look at this. This isn't about m mergers of police forces. This is about linking together the emergency services. Yeah, yeah. And but if you can't manage it with the police well, force, you can't manage it with the We need, we need to right? see where it works. Uh, and obviously, the, it, in your film you just showed, there are some questions about it that people have. And I think the Fire Brigade Union raised some important questions in their statement to you. So let's look at where it works. Seems to be working in Hampshire and Merseyside. Uh, let's see how it, uh, if we can link this together. And if we can save money, as has been saved money in Hampshire and Merseyside, if we can do the same, then you'll have more money to put police yeah, on the street. If people are cherry picking who they're going to join forces with, and, and oh. you've got those places of high demand that nobody wants to come in and join with, 
that's a problem. No, I don't the government think, has to do I don't anything. think in terms of our police forces and the different nature and disparate nature all over our country, not just in the east of England, I don't think you can have a one-size-fits-all policy. But what happens when I have to reduce um, the number of police officers in Bedfordshire below the level that we're at at the moment where the force is already operating at the limits of its capability. Short you know, answer, what but what, very what short happens answer. when because of the cuts that are being made and because the formula isn't giving us anything extra while giving £33 million pounds to the other five forces in Go on, the let me very quickly. What, what happens? Yeah. Um, first of all, we look, of course there have been tough decisions but actually crime has gone down by a quarter, even have, with even with the difficult the decisions that have been made by the government. Head, I think the <laughs> seventh highest level of knife crime per head, the eighth highest level mm. of burglary, mm. robbery and vehicle crime. We cannot afford to be reducing police numbers in Bedfordshire. And yet, and yet, that is, and wait, that yeah, is what uh, the formula is uh, about. And yet, to when do you have a, a referendum about asking the public if they wanted to increase the police precept in your own area, the public said overwhelmingly no. We must leave it there. We'll have a look at the week inside. Just a word about those streetlights. You're, you're for it, are you? Yes, I welcome what the councils have done. I campaigned for the streetlights to be turned on uh, for a long time and tabled motions in the last parliament about it. I would have preferred that it hadn't been done by raising the council tax. I actually think they could have made back office savings, particularly on printing and cancelling. There's a feeling, actually, that people pay newspaper. twice for this now in Essex, because they paid for it already. Well, the, the, the Essex Council decided that they were going to turn off the lights, and but they've said that they're happy to devolve the power to Harlow, but we have to pay for it. But I think we should have had some back office, office savings rather than cut council tax. But having said that, I really welcome the deal. I believe, especially as winter is, is approaching, that uh, we really need the lights back on and I welcome the deal. Just one thing on this, I mean a lot of people say that crime increases when you switch the lights off. What, what's your view on that? Uh, well, we haven't turned them off in Bedfordshire yet, except where pe local people have said that they're happy for that to happen. Um, but I think another issue that we also need to be cognizant of is uh, any impact that it have, has on road traffic collisions and road safety as well as whether people actually feel safe in their communities. And I have a lot of shift workers who contact me and uh, are, are really frightened of walking home at night in the dark and that's why I think that it's very important that the lights are kept on. Good. Both of you, thank you very much for being our guests this week. That's all from us. You can keep um, in touch via our website where you we will also find links to Deborah McGurran's blog. We're back at the same time next week. But for now, though, from all of us, it's back to Andrew in the studio.